us prepare our hearts for the opening prayer. O oh, awesome God, our provider, our battle fighter, our peace giver, our healer, and our ever-present friend, we thank you for a safe night of rest. We thank you for your gentle, loving touch, which awakened us this glorious morning to a day full of opportunities to go out beyond these walls and serve. Father, you have led us apart from a busy and unsettling world to the peace and quiet of your house. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we ask that you direct this service and those serving to support the unfolding of this worship experience so that all you have desired and committed to us is accomplished. Now, Lord, that we may not forget your word, we pray these prayers through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. You glad to be here, say amen. amen. You glad to see your neighbor, say amen. amen. You glad to see your pastor, say amen. amen. You glad to, no. <laughs> you glad, say amen. In the name of Jesus, we're all glad to be here. That's found on page 303 in your African American hymnal. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you have to flee. Oh, who can ever stand before us? When we call on that great name, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you have to free. Oh, who can ever stand before us when we call on that great name? Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory, victory, oh victory, we have the victory, victory, oh victory, we have the victory, oh victory. Oh, victory, oh, victory, we have the victory, victory, oh, victory, we have, we have the victory. Amen, amen. I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for protecting me, guiding me, loving me in spite of what I do and in spite of what I don't do. Amen? He's a forgiving and awesome God. Thank you, Lord. 
so good. Yes, he has. He's been so good. He's been so good. And I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. He's been so good, been so good. Yes, he has. He's been so good. Has he been good for you? Yes, he has. He's been so good. Oh, yeah. He's been so It is my prayer that today, if you came in with your well running a bit dry, that you're going to experience a renewal and a refreshing from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So as we have gathered together, I ask that we would continue in the frame of mind of worship with our hearts prepared to lift high God's holy name. I'm going to ask you to stand now as our liturgist leads us in our call to worship, which this morning will come from our Psalter. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with wisdom, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me here with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not from your spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice, were I to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. A sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and broken heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Would you please remain standing for the opening hymn, number 172, in the United Methodist Hymn.
anyone who's going to share with us our announcements? Well, if not, thank the Lord I brought some with me too. <laughs> the mission committee is again asking for your support in providing a monthly meal at the North End Soup Kitchen, and they need all of the financial and bodily support that you can give them. If you would please see Ken Hitz if you can help with that project. And the United Methodist Women's Hat and Brooch Luncheon is this coming Saturday, April 11th at noon. The cost is $12, and we hope that we see you there. And then finally, August 18th is the big food giveaway. 40 volunteers are needed at 8 a.m., and the doors open at 10 a.m. And I'm going to ask that you would please read your bulletin because there are more announcements inside as well. And if you could please pass the Ritual Friendship Registry so that we know who's here this morning, we'd deeply appreciate it. Thank you.
children, I'm just going to share. That song blesses me so much. At my old church, there was a woman about my age who, when she was in her 30s, had, when she was in her young years, 30 years ago, had a baby out of wedlock, and he grew up to write that song. And whenever I hear that song, I just remember how God is awesome. He is glorious, and how he turns things around to praise his holy name. God is a good God. I'm going to ask for our children to come forward at this time for our children's message. of things to ask you this morning. How can you tell when someone is grown up? How can you tell when you're looking at a grown up? Okay? Because they're taller. Anybody else? They wear makeup. Okay. Okay, yeah? They don't do things kids do. Anybody else? How can you tell a grown-up? Okay, two more people. They wear heels. They wear heels. Okay. They go to work. They have jobs. All right, last one, last one. They watch the news like you, Mom. They watch the news. <laughs> now, how can you tell when someone is growing in Christ? When someone is becoming more like Jesus. They act gooder. They act gooder. They pray. They should be a little more patient than they used to be. Well, what does it mean to look like Jesus? If we were to think about Jesus and think about us becoming more like Jesus, it means us becoming more loving like him. It means us being humble like him, which means not thinking that you're all that. You know what that means? Understanding that anything you have came from God. Well, what the Lord is looking for is not just for us to grow up and be healthy and be able to watch TV and watch the news and have a job and take care of people like your children, but God is also looking for us to grow up in Jesus. When you come to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, even at your young age, there are still ways that you can grow up in Jesus. And by that, I mean maybe being nicer to people at school, being even more respectful to your teachers than some of the other kids, because you understand that honors Christ, and honoring our mother and father and other adults as they honor Jesus. So I want you to know this, that just like there's signs of growing up to be an adult, there should be signs in every life of us growing up to be more like Jesus. And I hope as you come to Sunday school and read your Bibles and pray, you'll learn what some of those things are through the Word of God. So let's pray with me. Dear God, help me to learn to be more like Christ. Help me, Lord, to grow up in you and to learn to do the things that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing together. Jesus loves the little children. this time the altar is open for anyone who desires to come and pray.
God, on this Communion Sunday, as we prepare our hearts to partake of the blood which represents Jesus' body, the blood which represents his blood, the blood which is represented by the wine, and the bread which represents his body, God, we come and we lay down our bodies as living sacrifices before you. God, help us to cast aside anything that is unlike Christ and help us to humble ourselves to recognize that it is a privilege when you call us to come to your altar. It is a privilege when you tell us to come boldly before your throne of grace because that is something that we did not earn and do not deserve, but because Jesus is one who looked upon us one day and saw that we needed to be rescued and then volunteered to give his own life so that we could live because of what he did, his sacrifice and his love. We know, God, that we are surrounded and we are filled with your Holy Spirit as we surrender our hearts to you. So God, we come today as a forgiven people, as a chosen people, as a thankful people, as a grateful people for this opportunity to worship you today. Oh Lord, fill this place with your Holy Spirit and God, use our lives to witness about you that those in the street who've not yet met Jesus Christ will meet him in our faces, God. We'll experience his hand through our hands and our movements and our actions. So God, just, I pray, take this service to a whole new level and help us to go forth as your servants as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let us sing together the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us for the fear and lack of trust that allow us to see scarcity where you have provided abundance. We offer these gifts to you with confidence that you will work to multiply what we offer into overflowing blessings of abundance. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Today we will have two offerings. The second offering is for our scholarship fund.
almighty God of love and grace, you gave the greatest gift of all when you sent Jesus Christ into our midst to rescue us from our rebellion and to teach us the way to your kingdom. Please accept these gifts and bless them to lead more people to you and the wisdom of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Lord, help us to trust you this morning, to trust the leading of your Holy Spirit, and most importantly, trust the promises within your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come forth in a bold and mighty way and do a work in our hearts through this message. And God, I pray that it is you that would preach the message, not my flesh, but only you, as your Holy Spirit reigns in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, my question to you this morning is, are you moving on up? Not to a deluxe apartment in the sky, not only to our eternal dwelling place, which is a house in the heavens not made by hands, not to a better position at work, like the children we're talking about, adults do as work. A socioeconomic status is not what I'm talking about, or popularity, or even our physical state and being healthier. But are we moving on up to a level of maturity and God-likeness that God requires? Last week, someone posted on Facebook, which is a social network, a friend of mine from middle school wrote, rest in peace, Sherman Hensley. The words moving on up will never mean the same again. To which I replied, hopefully, now those words actually have true meaning for the first time. The Jeffersons was a hit show because it epitomized the American dream for us, making a go at it and not only surviving, but thriving as a people. However, as Christians, we must be taught to understand that there should be an even greater expectation, one of becoming daily more like Christ. You see, Jesus, in asking us to mature and move on up, is asking us to embrace something that our minds have not yet even conceived of. What God has in store for us is more than we could even hope for. The entire gospel explains that there is so much more and we find lessons on how to obtain it, especially in the writings of Paul. Have you ever heard these words? Be holy as I am holy. Putting the past behind me, I press on toward the mark of the high calling. Casting aside anything that hinders. These are verses that are talking about spiritual growth our walk toward a maturity and a thriving and a striving more like Christ himself. These verses are talking about truly moving on up, Amen. expecting to go up higher so that we know that we are not the same today as we were five years ago. Amen. That we know that we are not in the same state spiritually as we were 15 years ago. So that we know that we're not stuck in the same poor habits and frame of mind as 60 years ago. Amen. We should know that we have grown. And that somehow, as life has gone on, we have changed. And that we are daily being renewed and transformed. How have we matured? Not by our own estimations now, but by the estimations of others and more importantly, God. Are we now more Christ-like? Does he have a hold of your life? Is he the one that holds the reins, navigates the shores, steers and directs your pathway? Habakkuk 3.9 is so powerful that David himself repeated it again in the Psalms. It says, the Lord is my strength and he has made my feet like hind's feet and he makes me to walk on my high places. God wants to take us up higher in him. He longs for us to rise up just like the hind. The hind is a female red deer whose home is in the mountains. And the rear feet of the hind step in precisely the same spot that the front feet have just been. Every motion of the hind is followed through with a single focus consistency, making it the most sure-footed animal in all of the mountain areas. Now listen again to how the Lord describes what should be our spiritual walk with that of the hind as a comparison. The Lord is my strength. He has made my feet like hind's feet. He makes me walk on my high places. 
the Lord. Did you know he had something different for you, something higher for you, a place where the air is pure and the view is pristine and distractions are far below? But it's often just a narrow path, as the word says, a path just big enough for you and him. Are you willing to say, though none go with me, still I will follow? Because our feet step are supposed to go right behind him who walked first before us. Every step that God is asking us to take is to go where Christ has been, but we must understand that when we follow him, that path first leads to the cross. Christ's path always leads to the cross. Where first, in order to obtain new life, we must lay down this life. In order to live, we must first die. Die to the old ways of the flesh and die to the old self. It's true that the climb up to the high places is a bit more challenging than to just stay on level ground, to just walk in the valley. But if you've got those hind feet, the God that we serve makes your yoke easy and your burden light. The hind's feet are equipped for the toughest terrain, so you are ready. I'd like to believe that I have grown and seen more and know more than I did 20 years ago and that maybe I know a little better how to apply it. But I'll tell you one thing, as I look back on some of the toughest times of my life, the roughest times of my life, that terrain where I wondered would I make it through, those were the most valuable life lessons to be learned. The ones that I cherish now, and don't you? Because they came with a price. They always do. But at the same time, I have to be honest with you, I can look back and I can laugh at some of the silly things that I did. And for me, unfortunately, some of the silly things I did were exposed because I was either a preacher or a reporter, so everybody saw them. In my younger years, 20 years back, I got my first break, and I was very young. When I got my first talk show, I was 22. By the time I was 23, I was on radio and TV, but I was far from as mature as I needed to be. And thankfully, I can look back and just chuckle. One of the times when I was at WGPR in Detroit, I was walking out the door, and as I was walking out, this little short man held the door for me, and he was so short and I was so tall that I ducked under his arm. And as I looked back, I said, thanks, George, and I kept on walking. And I turned back, I said, George, George Jefferson. He said, my name is Sherman Hensley. <laughs> But it was not nearly as bad as my much more mature coworker who was 26. One day she was waiting for some people coming for an interview and they were late. She was getting nervous, pacing back and forth. She was waiting for three men and she saw three men out in the hallway and she tapped on the glass of the newsroom. You see, newsrooms often are surrounded by glass. But when she tapped on that glass, everybody looked up because it just reverberated. And she said to those men, excuse me, are you the fat boys? And they looked at her and they were like, no. <laughs> it was so embarrassing, everybody wanted to climb under their desks. But we were not nearly as immature as our news director. She was a big 29. <laughs> and one day when we were on the air, channel 62, someone called in during election season with a complaint. They were concerned because in Detroit, you still went to the polling booths and you had to vote with pen and paper, pencil and paper. And she understood that many people in the suburbs had a punch machine. Well, the lady sitting next to me, who evidently had never voted, turned and said to the camera, I can't believe you expect refreshments when you go to vote. I'm looking at her like, what are you talking about? She said she's asking for tea and crumpets, pump and punch and cookies. I said, let's go to a commercial break. She was talking about the punch machine where you vote, and she thought she was talking about a punch machine to buy punch. We were an immature mess. But let me tell you, I can look back and laugh at that. But what I can't laugh at, because it's just too serious, is when it comes to spiritual immaturity. Because see, spiritual immaturity that leads to some of the problems in life that God is trying to help us to stay from walking into. That, 
leads to some of the issues and concerns that weighs on our hearts and we wonder why I'm in, in this place. And the Lord says, step up a little higher and you won't be in that place anymore. Spiritual immaturity is what God wants to prevent by helping us to open up to the fact that the ways that Jesus wants us to live, the ways that Jesus wants us to walk, the words that he gives us to warn us are to protect us, to lead us, to guide us, and to bless us. So it's not enough to just attend church because you can still be spiritually immature. It's not enough just to be baptized in Jesus' name but yet still fall short of making him Lord of your life. It's not enough just to serve, but still to fail to surrender. We can be unwise and unholy despite the fact that we show up unless we are moving on up. What God longs for us because he loves us and he deeply cares is for us to want more, more in him and for us to desire his goals, for us to seek to be refined, for us to seek to be mature, to refine means to remove impurities, whether you're talking about oil or precious metals or whether it's Jesus talking about souls. The dictionary defines refine as to free from coarse, unsuitable, and immoral characteristics. And for weeks, that has been my theme, that God would move us on higher, that God would do more even for us than we long for for ourselves. God is seeking to enlarge our territory, improve our lives, and transform our hearts. But the heart part has to come first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto it. But even though sometimes we fall short, we are not perfect even as we're seeking. Even as we're trying to move on up, if you can at least say, I thank the Lord that while I'm not where I wish I was, at least I'm not where I used to be. If you can at least say that, if you can at least acknowledge that God is in a process of refining you, it's going to be all right. Malachi 3.6 says, he will sit as the refiner and purifier of silver. Well, this verse one day was puzzling some women in a Bible study. And they wondered, what does this statement say about the character and nature of God? One of the women offered to find out the process of refining silver and bring it back to the group the next week in Bible study. So that week she called a silversmith and she made an appointment to watch him work. She didn't mention anything about her class or her reason for her interest beyond her curiosity in the process of refining silver. As she watched the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over the fire and he lit it heat up. He explained that refining silver, as you're doing it, you need to hold that silver right in the middle of the flames where it's the hottest to burn away the impurities. And as the woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot sometimes, she remembered that verse, he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit right there in front of that fire the whole time that that silver was being refined. And the man said yes. He not only had to sit there holding that silver, but he had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time that it was in the fire. If the silver was left even one moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. So she just sat there silent for a moment. Then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And he smiled and he answered, oh, that's easy, when I see my image in it. The more that you mature in Christ, people ought to see his image in you. When you're feeling the heat from the fire, remember that God has his eyes on you and he has his hands on the thermostat. He will keep watching you until he sees his image in you. In all things and through all things, through all sorts of circumstances, God is working in us. And sometimes how hot the fire is, how high the flames are, and how long the fire lasts depends on you and how pliable we are. God knows just what he needs to do to mature us to be the jewels that he desires us to be. But sometimes people will leave the church or walk away from the Lord because they figure this old adage must be true. If you can't take the heat, you better be get out of the kitchen. But spiritually, the opposite is true. God is preparing a meal for us. 
And sometimes as things are heating up, that's because we're moving on up, and often the key to how long it takes is our response. Simple as that. We must learn to recognize that often when we are going through something tough, one of three things is happening. Number one, maybe you messed up and God is using it to teach you an awesome lesson. That's just real. But number two, God might have initiated it. You've done nothing wrong, but ultimately it's because it's going to be a blessing. Amen. And the third one is simply this. The devil did intend it for your harm, but God allowed it because he knew that he could bring about good. No matter what it is, don't be put off by the process that God uses to refine you, even when it includes some annoyances from the adversary, the devil. Do you know how pearls are made? Natural pearls form under a set of accidental conditions when a teeny tiny microscopic intruder or a parasite gets caught inside the oyster shell. It's irritating that oyster, just like some of our situations and people and circumstances that come into our lives unsettle and irritate us. <laughs> However, there is a great lesson to be learned from the oyster. The way that the oyster responds can bless you today. You see, the mollusk starts off by zoning out that substance, making good of some materials it gained in its juvenile years. In its young years, that oyster developed a pearly lining in its shell, and it begins to corner off that irritant and cover it. You see, the oyster has this God-given ability to just cover it and cover it and cover it. That is, cover any threat or any distraction in much the same way that the blood of Jesus covers us, in much the same way that love covers a multitude of sins, in much the same way that we can be covered by the mantle of God, and in the same way that the anointing of God seeks to cover you as you follow his wills and his ways. As we remain faithful in the Lord, God covers and protects us. That is his promise. But this is the way that the oyster operates. Because even when that irritant is actually a predator or a parasite that has attacked it, causing trauma and embedded itself in its tissue, the oyster survives because it corners it off rather than letting it take over. <laughs> then as the oyster, layer by layer, covers that substance with something pearly and silky, after a long while, whether than, rather than worrying about that threat, the oyster just goes on about daily life. How do we keep on moving up and moving on when we're threatened with traumas and drama and distractions and serious threats that seek to kill, steal, and destroy? We move on and move up when we come to rest, realize that all of it is in God's hands, God's got it covered, and we need to just rest in him. You see, I'm going to close by sharing with you that this is a true scientific explanation that the making of the pearl has spiritual implications because the pearl is a rare and precious jewel. You don't just always find pearls in nature. The pearls that are cultured and refined in nature come right from the midst of an adversarial situation, a threat, or a challenge. Yet the pearl is so perfectly round because the oyster allows what was once an intrusion and what was once a problem to be transformed into a priceless gem. And you know what's at the center of every single real pearl? A mummified parasite, long dead and gone, but put to use because it's been covered. Embedded in the lives of some of the most beautiful people you want to meet, some of the people with the greatest testimonies you want to meet, some of the people with the greatest faith you want to meet, are problems and trials that God has taken over when he took a hold of their lives and covered them with the wings of love. What I want to say to you this morning is God has us covered. God loves you. He wants to do the same for you that he's done for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, and Paul, and Silas. God wants to move you on up, but sometimes he's going to allow us to be in situations where we have to learn how to trust him. God wants you to learn to believe that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God wants you to learn to receive and believe that he has a perfect plan for you. God wants you to know that before you were formed in your mother's womb, he already knew you. And that same God who had his 
hand hovering over your life then has not stopped hovering to this moment. God wants to move us to a new level of faith where we know that he's brought us this far and he's not about to leave us. God wants you to remember that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God wants you to know that he never leaves the righteous forsaken. And his mercies are new every morning. And if this word is not for you, it may be for someone else that you know because there's people giving up hope every day. There's people struggling, wondering, how am I going to make it on? There's people like the young woman I mentioned who had a baby out of wedlock over 30 years ago and his song, her son lived to sing a song that is blessing our nation. We need to be able to have a long-term view, not just a short-term view, to see how God can change things around. But let me just tell you, if you think you know someone living on Easy Street, it's just not true and it's just not possible. Because even with the pearl, the only way to tell a real pearl that has come from an oyster and one that has been cultured to sell to you but is fake is this, x-ray technician. When you look at a real pearl through an x-ray, what you see is layers upon layers and rings upon rings of a pearly substance right around a sarcophagus. One of the greatest scientific minds of all times, Raphael Dubois, once described the pearl in this way, the most beautiful pearl is nothing more in fact, than a brilliant sarcophagus of a dead worm. <laughs> the story of Christ himself is the story of God bringing beauty and life out of death. It is the story of God bringing life out of ashes. And it is the story, if you allow him, of God making a gem and a refined jewel, one that can stand the fire out of you. What God will do with the grit and the dirt and the attacks and the pain is cover it to make it a blessing unto you. Let us pray. God, I just thank you for your word, which is an encouraging word, because each one of us have been through some stuff. Some of us, it's because we tripped and we stumbled, but we realize today you can make our feet like hind's feet if we trust you. Some of us, it's because the enemy has attacked, Lord, but we are still standing strong, knowing greater is he in us than he that is in the world. For some of us, Lord, we've won the victory, but we just need to learn how to claim it. For you have told us if we would just proclaim your word, if you would be lifted up, then you would draw all others unto you. And sometimes our testimony in the midst of it all is what will tell other people that Jesus lives. God, on this communion Sunday, help us to lay down our lives as those who are seeking to live through Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen. amen. If you are someone who's seeking to know Jesus Christ as Lord, or if you are someone who's looking for a church home, I want you to know that the doors of the church are now open, and I'm going to ask us to stand and sing today, Grace That Is Greater Than Our Sin, hymn number 365.
At this time, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to page 13 in your United Methodist Hymnal. We are going to share together in word and table number two. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself for us, he took the bread and he broke it, and he said to his disciples, take and eat, this is my body which is given in remembrance of you. And then, after the supper was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of God's mighty acts, and the offering of praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering us for us, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. the confidence of children of God that we would pray together the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'm going to ask the communion stewards to keep, please come forward with our musicians. They will partake of communion first as the choir prepares to come down and around and be ready at the floor after they've partaken. Please kneel as you are able. 
the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. As a chosen and forgiven people, please go forth. Please meek, meekly kneel as you are able. With thankful hearts, please go forth to be a blessing.
meekly kneel as you are able. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. May our hearts be as one as you go forth a chosen and forgiven people. Please meek me kneel as you are able. For you is the body of Christ, which was given for you. And the blood of Christ, which was shed for you for the remission of sins. Go forth with great thanksgiving for the God of their tender mercies. as you are able. The body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus Christ, you have won the victory. Rise and go forth to proclaim that to others. able. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. People of God, proclaim his good news as you go forth that you have been forgiven. as you are able. Before you is the body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Please rise and go forth a thankful and forgiven people.
thank you for inviting us to the heavenly meal. Lord, where this side of heaven we experience a feasting time with you, where we recognize that that which we have partaken is the body of Christ, as he died the death that we deserve to die on that cross, and the blood of Christ that was shed for our redemption. Lord, as we go forth from this people, a thankful and grateful people, for what we have done, Lord, through you this day, knowing that you have forgiven us and that you have renewed us to now go forth and take that word to someone else. May we not take it lightly, Lord, that you have now called us to go forth with your blessing, to be a blessing to all that we meet, especially those who need to come to know your name. May they see your image in us and therefore come to know Christ as Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time, I'm going to ask if we have any visitors with us who are visiting today, if you would please stand and share with us, especially those who may be visiting for the first or second time. Amen. Welcome, welcome. We are so glad to have you here today. I'm going to ask you to please share your names. It is good to see you too. Amen. Please share with us your name. Amen. It is good to have you. Praise the Lord. us to sing together our closing hymn, Oh, How I Love Jesus, hymn number 170. And as we sing, the light of Christ will go forth into the world just as we prepare to go forth into the Lord, world. Let us stand.
to say to the ushers board, thank you very much. They called and asked if I would like a much lighter robe because it was so hot up here, and I feel very blessed this morning. And now for our benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Peace of God be with you all. Let us share the peace as we go forth. Amen.